This is Cross and Crown Radio and the Gospel Truth Podcast, and I'm Mike Robinson, your host. So glad that you're with us today. Our topic is Presuppositional Apologetics Examines Hinduism. We're going to give an overview, and if you want to get my book on it, you can get that on Amazon. It's called Christian Presuppositions Examines Hinduism. It's on Amazon. I wrote about this uh, in 2008 with uh, the book One Way to God, and with that I have a chapter uh, having presuppositional apologetics refuting Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, and the Mormon faith. And you can see each of those now in book form fully and expanded on Amazon. Buddhism, Hinduism, Islam, as well as Mormonism and Jehovah's Witnesses all refuted using presuppositional apologetics. Some say presuppositional apologetics has not been used or utilized refuting world religions. Well, all the way back in 2008 I started it, and you can see all my other books for the last few years examining world religions. So let's start on Hinduism. The main thing to remember with reaching out to folks that are stuck in Hinduism, or Islam, or Buddhism, or a cult, is that they're people. And these people need God. They need Jesus. It's not about winning an argument. It's not about showing them how smart you are by using presuppositional apologetics. But it's about reaching the person by the power of God's gospel according to God's grace. So when you go through this, don't utilize this information just to make yourself look good. First, all people of all false religions, they need to hear the law and the gospel. A lot of times you only have to get into the presuppositional apologetics, just demonstrate how you and them and all people sin, we all fall short, and we need a Savior, and that's Jesus. So give them the law, even specifics, commandments that you know that they've broken and that you've broken, then preach them the gospel. Also, if you have time, obviously discuss the uniqueness of Christ. These things are very, very important, much more important than even presuppositional apologetics. But once you get into a discussion and you've told them about their need of a Savior, you've given them the gospel, you've revealed their sin, and they just want to fight about it, you can give them some reasons why Christianity is true and reasons why they can know that Hinduism is false or whatever religion they have. Hinduism posits that all is made, an illusion. This illusion would include Hinduism. On the ground of Hinduism... Hinduism is an illusion. Illusions are not real, thus Hinduism is not real. So there you go, right from the start. Hinduism, secondly, posits that all is maya, all is an illusion. This illusion would include the doctrine of maya. On Hinduism ground, maya is an illusion. Illusion is not real, maya is not real. So you can refute it that way also. I'll give you some transcendental arguments in a little bit. I'll demonstrate presuppositionally why Hinduism can't possibly be true and why Christianity must be true. It's interesting to note that most practicing Hindus are those who believe in many gods. They believe in polytheism. They believe in sometimes worship many gods. They believe that everything is merely an illusion. Now when you understand these doctrines from Hindus or Muslims or Buddhists or whatever, ask them questions first. Because some people are not educated in their own religion. So you want to ask them what they believe and not just tell them Shiva, Krishna, Brahma, or whatever. All is an illusion, including their worship, including their God. Or the doctrine that all is an illusion is false. Much of mainstream Hinduism teaches that evil is just an illusion. Because it's part of all things that are an illusion. To mark anything as evil, one needs an invariant universal moral code. And Hinduism lacks such a code because they teach, again, all is an illusion. Hinduism is utterly deficient in this because everything is just an illusion according to their doctrine, including any moral law, including even that which identifies evil as evil. The belief that everything is maya, maya, everything is an illusion, denies real evil because it's just one more aspect of this omni-illusion. In this perspective, one cannot truly claim that rape or genocide or mass pollution or child abuse or any other wicked acts, they cannot claim that they're ultimately evil because they're just an illusion. Evil is just an illusion. This, of course, confutes itself because lying 
would not be evil and it would not be really anything because it's just an illusion. Lying would just be an illusion under strict Hinduism thought. So it would be just an aspect of illusion. The law of identity would also simply be an illusion. So Hinduism cannot ground the laws of logic. One could lie over and over and assert the opposite of what the Hindu really states. So whatever the Hindu says, you can just assert the opposite and say that's what the Hindu, Hindu actually said. And you can see how this could get very confusing and demonstrate the weakness of the, their worldview. There is no distinctions within Hinduism. Then if that is true, then all suppositions are just as valid as their antithesis. This is illogical and it stultifies itself, so it cannot be true. Furthermore, one can ask if a Hindu, ask the Hindu person, the Hindu man or woman, if removing Hinduism from the earth would be evil. Ask them that. Makes them think a little bit. Because if an all, all is an illusion, then Hindu is an illusion. If there is no evil, then removing Hinduism from the world would not be evil because there is no ultimate evil. If all is just an illusion, then that would imply that men and bugs and logic and ethics and Hinduism and reincarnation are just illusions and in fact do not exist. Now let me give you another syllogism. Any rational person, R, must presuppose, W, that the world is intelligible and is not an illusion. R knows W, but only if it is logically possible that R believes that W cannot be true and false at the same time. W, only if there is some truth, L, which equals the laws of logic, and they are immutable, universal. So W and L, only if there is some ultimate source, Y, or Yahweh, who is also immutable and has universal reach and power, transcendental elements, and go deeper in the transcendental thought and presuppositional Paul Jakes as we go through here. Under Hinduism, God or the gods cannot be the absolute standard for absolute good since everything is illusion, including that which is good. If the Hindu takes the doctrine of illusion as true, he cannot in principle conclude that God or the gods are really good. If this were the case, there would be no real standard of goodness. This leads to the conflation and commingling of good and bad, as well as evil and the righteous, under Hinduism. So, under consistent Hinduism, the actual division between good and evil is eliminated. When everything is merely an illusion, there is no good and therefore there is no evil. Either everything is an illusion, or it isn't. So, you must kind of gently press it on them. Remember, you're talking to real people, even if it's online, you're talking to a uh, minister, is because I, I started my ministry on college campuses. And even then, when I was mainly a evidentialist, I came across many world religions. So I had to develop ways to demonstrate they're false and why Christianity is true. But I wanted to treat them as people, real people who need Jesus. They really, really need Jesus. And this is what we must keep in front of our minds that no matter who you're talking to, even if they're belligerent, even if they're angry, I had Muslims actually say they're going to bomb me and kill me because in, in gentleness and respect I told them how false their religion was. So you have to do that sometimes, but you want to do it with gentleness and respect and patience. Of course, Hinduism, if everything's an illusion, then Hinduism is an illusion. Clearly everything cannot be an illusion or that assertion that everything is an illusion, is an illusion, and the assertion defeats itself and cannot be the case. So that's really important to understand. Now, stipulating, as Hinduism does, that truth is one, so now we're going to go over on the other side into their monism, truth is one is inconsistent with the logical law of identity and the law of non-contradiction and the law of excluded middle, the three laws of logic. This is self-impaling, considering that the proclamation is required to employ the very laws of logic itself. Proclaiming that use, utilizes and must utilize the laws of logic. If it's true, it's false. If it's false, of course it's false. The position of the Hindu and his thought is irrational and self-confuting. And that's why you have to be gentle with these folks. And that's ultimately true with all false religions. And that's why you have to be gentle and patient with them. But press the truth on them. Press the truth. Hinduism asserts that all is one. 
This clashes with the law of identity and the law of non-contradiction. Yet the assertion that all is one presupposes and utilizes the laws of logic in that denial. Ergo, Hinduism is self-confounding. That's just the way it is. There's no way around it. Hinduism is irrational in so many counts, just like all false religions. Hinduism adds to its irrationality when it denies that there are true distinctions. If distinctions do not truly exist, then there is no distinction between true and false, right and wrong, good and bad, yes and no, a and not a, Hinduism and anti-Hinduism. Now, there's another doctrine they believe in, karma. Uh, the word karma has kind of been brought into even Western culture as kind of you reap what you sow even here on earth. But that is not strictly how karma works. Karma, though, is a significant doctrine in Hindu thought. It's a notion that all beings, after they die, come back in life after life until they obtain righteous enlightenment or liberation and they pay for all their past misdeeds and sins and are rewarded for their good deeds and their righteousness in their next life in coming again and living on the earth. They can come again as a person, low caste or high caste, depending on their life, or they can come back as a bug or an animal, insect or a germ or something like that. It depends on how well you lived. But if all is one and all things are illusion, there cannot be anything that is bad, so you cannot say something has bad karma. Since there's no bad karma, reincarnation makes no sense because I can't ultimately do anything bad to earn this next position in my next life or that position in the next life because there's no ultimate judgment to discern such things because there's no standard because all things are an illusion and there's no distinction and all things are one. You can see how layer after layer after layer confounds itself in Hindu thought, stultifies itself in Hindu doctrine. Now, after escaping the karmic cycle, if you can do this, if that is a doctrine, then that is also an illusion. So being a Hindu cannot be good, nor can having oneself immersed in the sewage of the Gandhi's river be good or bad. So I don't know why they do it, since all is an illusion, since there's really no ultimate good and bad. Of course, you can see it's completely inconsistent. If everything lacks distinctions, there is no distinction between an illusion and not an illusion. Personal enlightenment is not right, and everything else is neither good or bad. Kissing my wife is not any different than killing an infant, ultimately, if you extend Hindu thought into practice, which obviously no one recommends. Burning down a rainforest is not bad, nor is planting a hundred trees and feeding. Personality, distinctions, obligations cannot arise from that which has no personality. Hinduism lacks a ground for personality and posits that personality is just an illusion. Men have no personalities. Hinduism, thus, is fallacious. The ultimate goal, of course, is to end up as one drop in the cosmic ocean, so you lose your personality again. I really like my personality that God created in his image. I don't want to lose my personality. I want to be in heaven when I die as who I am redeemed by Christ. Right? That's what I want. That's part of what, how God has equipped me, and that's what I want to see. I don't want to see myself turn into a drop in the cosmic ocean and lose all my identity. What's the point? Now, reincarnation is the process of coming into flesh again, Implied is the notion that there is something to us that is separate from the flesh or the body that returns after death. This transmigration of a soul is what comes forth in the next life. It is your old self dies and now you're born as somebody else or something else in the next life. Reincarnation. It's defined in Hindu dictionaries as the crossing of the soul from one body to another. You could have been a cockroach or a sewer rat in the past life. Maybe you were one of the numerous Caesars, Julius Caesars or Napoleons, whom a multitude of people who believe in reincarnation believe that they were many times at the same time. How can that be? They insist. You know, you get all the people that insist they were Julius Caesar together. There's hundreds and hundreds of them. That cannot be the case because only one person could be Napoleon in the past. 
So you can see how it refutes itself. Hindu sage Yogananda revealed that Abraham Lincoln had once been a yogi in the Himalayas. Stephen Rosen admits that reincarnation forgetfulness is a problem for those who believe in the transmigration of the soul. In other words, you forget a lot of what you did in the past life. How does that help you in this life? Okay, I, I did all these good things, I did all these bad things, and now I'm born in, in a new life, I'm born as a new person, and I don't even remember it all. I don't remember anything. Almost nobody remembers anything about their past lives. You have a few exceptions that say they do, but most of us don't. This is a big problem. See, I teach my children to learn from their past mistakes. How much more should we learn from our past lives? We want to get the same correct, right? We want to get the same right. We should remember our past mistakes from our past lives, but we don't. You can see the problem there. Why does it take endless chanting, hypnote regression therapy, or some Eastern mystic masters to bring back simple memories from a past lifetime. A lifetime lived with failures, flops, foibles, and mistakes that nets nothing learned. This seems irrational and immoral. I want to learn from my past mistakes so I don't come back as a cockroach. The notion of reincarnation is a major tenet of Hindu thought. In a Gallup poll, 20% of all American adults believe in reincarnation. And most of those aren't Hindus. The way in which the Hindu discovers enlightenment is to be infused in a union with Brahma. Nevertheless, Jesus Christ supplied the perfect and eternal reconciliation between the true and living God, the triune God, Yahweh, and believing sinful men through the work of the cross. Additionally, the Holy Spirit brings true union with God and the believer, yet there's still distinctions. The spiritual union with God through Christ by the Holy Spirit requires no work, merit, or effort on the part of the Christian. Rather, God gave his only begotten Son as a free gift of grace. You trust in him that he died for you and God raised him from the dead by God's grace. You're born again, you're saved, and justified, you're declared righteous. This is good news. Now, within my book on Hinduism, as well as my books on Islam and Buddhism, I give some uh, real life conversations I had, numerous conversations I had with people of world religions. The way that I employ presuppositional apologetics. You can get those in my books. Hinduism, uh, presuppositional apologetics examines Hinduism as well as presuppositional apologetics examines Buddhism, Islam, or Mormonism, and Jehovah's Witnesses. You can get any of those books and see countless conversations I had with real people where I tried to really care for them, I tried to really pray for them, I tried to give them the truth, the law and the gospel, and then utilize presuppositional apologetics in refuting those false religions. Let me give you a very brief uh, part of a conversation I had with a Hindu on a college campus named Tom. Tom said, he starts off by saying, the laws of logic are not necessary. And I say, so you agree that the laws of logic are necessary. See what I did right there? He says they're not necessary. I say, you said they are necessary. So I'm contradicting him on what he actually said to demonstrate he cannot live under that worldview. So then Tom says, no, I said that the laws of logic are not necessary. So you agree that the laws of logic are necessary, I replied. No, are you hard of hearing? I said the laws of logic are not necessary, not necessary. So you agree that the laws of logic are necessary. Why are you contradicting me? I said clearly that the laws of logic are not necessary. So you acknowledge the laws of logic are necessary because you are upset that I contradicted you. For this contradiction to be an actual contradiction, one must believe in the laws of logic, including the law of non-contradiction. One cannot avoid contradiction if one attempts to deny the laws of logic. To prove this, all I have to do is say that you actually said the opposite of what you said, and keep doing that to demonstrate you cannot live under that worldview. So false gods do not satisfy. False religions do not supply atoning satisfaction, which is ultimately what's important. God, Yahweh, the triune God, is righteous and holy, and he requires a just accounting for all souls. The duty of the believer is to show the Hindu 
with love and patience and gentleness that he's broken all of God's holy laws. All Hindus and all other people, including ourselves, have trampled upon the first three commandments as well as all ten of them. We must place the law upon their hearts. We should urge them to give up their idols and come to the true and living God. You do this even if you think it's not going to be successful. Because sometimes that person gets saved the next day or the next week or ten years later. You don't know. Give them the law. Give them the gospel. I've seen this happen in my life on many occasions. The Ten Commandments is to be employed to send them to Christ. They must understand that their good works cannot pay the penalty for past sins, and karma cannot pay that. Jesus Christ paid the price for all of our sins on the cross, all the sins of the ungodly, and that includes us and includes them. Future good works cannot erase past transgressions. Romans 3.20 says, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. The law reveals the sin of all human beings. One needs to turn to Jesus Christ and receive complete pardon, complete forgiveness. Now the true God, Yahweh, the triune God, has a seity, and he is the being in which nothing greater can be conceived. The Hindu gods are not supreme because they're just one of many millions of deities under Hindu thought. If a Hindu sect posits that their God is the greatest God, whether they say it's Brahma, Shiva, or Krishna. Remember, this God does not have the attributes of the true God. That God has to have universal reach and power, has to be immutable, as well as have other attributes, including a city. None of the Hindu gods have that. Another problem, so they cannot account for the laws of logic, they cannot account for all the things that are required for a rational environment to be in place, for a moral environment to be in place. They cannot give you those necessities that need to be in place. Another problem arises because Hinduism claims that all is one. Thus, Brahma is everything, and he is nothing in particular. Everything and nothing at the same time. Additionally, everything is a mere illusion, and that would include the Hindu gods, including Brahma. In contrast, the Bible declares that God can do everything, and that no purpose of his can be withheld from him. But the thoughts of Shiva or Brahma could be hindered by Vishnu or Krishna or another god with his own inherent limitations. Accordingly, it's obvious that these gods are not the god of the Bible. God said to Moses, I am who I am. God is our rock, Deuteronomy 32 says. Polytheism, though, is a result of empty feelings and not revelation because men have felt a lack in the gods that are made with man's hand according to the imagination of men. Hindus have at least 330 gods. Now there are some exceptions to that, especially some Hindu scholars, but most average Hindus believe in millions and millions of gods. They might have one main family one, or one for a particular town or culture, but they believe that the other gods do exist. Shiva, Krishna, and Brahma contained trinity, as Vantil would say. Non-existence is impossible for God, yet possible for all other deities among the countless Hindu gods. The Hindu gods are part of the ongoing flux and cosmic oneness. In contrast to the transcendence and immutability of Yahweh, who is involved in his aseity. Since the true God is self-sufficient, he does not need to change somewhere that is unchanging and has aseity. Deny that the true God exists as ultimate, as self-sufficient. We could not know anything. We could not even reason that God exists nor could we ask a question about God or a question about Hinduism, so God must exist. Knowledge is necessary for even suggesting that there is no knowledge, as Hinduism ultimately claims. Reason demands an absolute, self-sufficient, and unchanging base for the intelligibility of the world, and that's Yahweh, the triune God. He must exist to account for the unchanging, transcendent laws of logic. The laws of logic are universal and immutable, and they require a ground that is also immutable and has universal reach and power as a God of the Bible alone has. The gods of polytheism cannot supply the required pre-essentials for absolute and unchanging realities. Only the Lord God can. In fact, Hinduism does not even attempt to account for the laws of logic, since in principle they even deny that there are laws of logic as well as everything else is also an illusion. 
the Lord God of Israel has a nature and capacity to furnish that which is necessary to make sense of the world. As a religion and a philosophy, Hinduism itself spoiling philosophy of life as it proclaims that all men, beauty, ideas, laws, forms, norms, meaning, honor, dignity, justice, ethics, truth, and reality are all illusions. In fact, Hinduism itself is an illusion. All doctrine within Hinduism is an illusion. The Hindu himself is an illusion. Everything in the universe, including the universe itself, is an illusion. And so it's all self-stultifying and all false. It cuts a hole in the box it sits in, a box full of false notions and evil gurus. Hinduism asserts that true distinctions do not exist. The laws of logic are distinct from other things. Hinduism utilizes the laws of logic. Hinduism is self-refuting. So as I said earlier, as you reach out to our Hindu friends, relatives, loved ones, or people just on the internet in the marketplace, first of all, they need to hear the law and the gospel. Preach them the cross. Preach them Jesus. Tell them about your wonderful Savior. You may not ever have to get into presuppositional apologetics. If you do, get my book. Go through this lecture again and reach out to your Hindu friends on the internet and in the marketplace for the glory of God. Now, if you're out there and you do not know Jesus, and you've heard this, uh, if you heard the gospel today that Jesus died on the cross for all of our sins, he was buried, and God raised him from the dead. And if you trust in Jesus, his person, his work, you now have a place in him. Well, you say, I'm a Hindu, or I'm a Muslim, or I'm an atheist. Well, forget all that. Put all that away. Turn from all that and turn to Christ. And you can say this to your Heavenly Father. Say, Father, I believe. God's grace is touching your heart right now through his word and spirit. Cry out to the Father. I believe in Jesus. I believe he's a son of God and the son of man. I believe he died on the cross for all my sins. And I believe that God raised him from the dead on the third day. I give him my heart. I give him my life. I turn from all my ways. And I will follow Jesus all the days of my life. If that's you, you can go ahead and contact us. And we'll send you any two free books you want. If you just recently got saved, became a Christian, write us. We love to send those. We even pay for the postage. If you're Hindu or a former Hindu, you can write us. We'll send you my book on Hinduism or Islam or whatever other religion that you come from or you're reaching out to. But this is Pastor Mike Robinson. Until next time, saying may God richly bless you.